Hello, and welcome to the MacGuffinPodcast.com. I'm John, and I'm joined by director Justin Chadwick, whose film The First Grader is the opening night film at SIF 2011. And a couple years ago, he made The Other Boleyn Girl with recent Oscar winner Natalie Portman. So thank you for joining us, Justin. Pleasure. Uh, the first question I have is, um, how did you first get involved with The First Grader? Had you heard the true story it's based on, or did you first get offered the film, and that's how it came about for you? Well, I, I was sent the original first draft of the script, and the article that was on the front page of the LA Times by David Thompson, who was my producer on The Other Berlin Girl, and I've worked with him before. Um, and I just thought it was a really intriguing story and different from what I'd usually seen coming from an Af African uh, from base, you know, that this was a, an uplifting story about a very human story that kind of was celebratory and it wasn't issue driven, it wasn't about genocide or or um, a particular issue, but it had this chance to be something that was, was different. And, um, and then so I got on a plane and I went to Nairobi and I went and met the real man that it was based on, oh, wow. talked to him, he was 89, he was... Uh, he was, uh, he was in a hospice, he was very sick at that time. And um, so I went to meet him and talk to him and talk to him about his life. And, and, uh, and that really was the inspiration for me to kind of to do it because as those conversations, all those stories emerged that you see in the film. Great. Um, what was your relationship like with the screenwriter Ann Peacock? Did you um, want any redrafting done when you came on the project or how do you collaborate with your writers? Well, she's brilliant, Anne, you know, because, you know, she'd, she'd been there, she'd met the, the Kamani Maruge, she'd met Jane Abinchu, the teacher that it's based on as well, she talked, um, and then when I went to Kenya, I started to kind of do my own research, spent a lot of time with him, went and met the teacher, talked to the pupils, but also being there, soaking up the, the, all the stories, I mean, I felt very conscious always that being from outside I would go in and listen and observe and watch and we were working with predominantly a Kenyan crew so and a Kenyan cast so they didn't know this backstory this this atrocious kind of history that Britain and Kenya had had and so they started to talk to their parents and then stories started to come back from those conversations and I started to incorporate them in the fit in the film and Anne was really open to that and I think that all the time we were in prep when you're making a true story, you, you know, and you're from outside, it was it was important to me to really get underneath the surface of that country and be truthful and be truthful to Kenya and not make it, you know, obvious. You know, so many times films that have been shot in a foreign uh, country like Kenya are seduced by the beauty and it is very, very beautiful and the cinematography is stunning in the film, but this is a different kind of um, cinematography. It's a different kind of Kenya that you see up on the big screen. Mm -hmm. And so being from an English background yourself, did that kind of affect you at all with how the history of the story you were telling? Was there kind of any hesitation by anyone on the Kenyan crew that here was this director who wasn't Kenyan coming in? Or was that just something that, you know, all people can tell all stories? I, I, was, I was aware, you know, at the beginning because I was a guest in the country. I was aware to make sure that I, I listened first and foremost and also you know going around the country is to you know I was using a Kenyan crew I was working alongside Kenyans who I'd always go into each community that I went into talk to the elders get involved in the community and I went in on my own and you know with those K Kikuyu or Maasai if I was in the Kikuyu or Maasai regions and really talk to people and and I never had any problem whatsoever with you know, because I think that people understood the way that we were making the film. Um, I mean, you couldn't make some of those scenes up. You know, the riot of the children standing up against that. That came directly from the sources that it happened to. Uh, his visceral kind of backstory, you know, he, he, he told me about his wife. He told me about what the British had done. He, you know, along with 1.2 million Kikuyu, was incarcerated for eight years, tortured every day, lost everything. Um, and he told me those direct stories, so I knew it was something that I couldn't shy away from, you know, and I had to be honest with it. Mm. And so on your projects thus far, you've just been a director. You haven't had any screenplay credits. Um, is that something you're interested in getting involved in in the future, or do you kind of collaborate with writers and you handle the direction? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I like stories. And so, you know, with filmmaking, particularly when you're, when you're dealing with a real story, obviously things are going to continue to develop all the time and yeah I mean I, I 
I'm interested in telling a good story and how you visually interpret that. And working alongside someone like Anne or Peter Morgan, as I did on my last film, you know, it's a collaboration. You know, you it's um, you need everybody. So it's, it's a team effort making a film. And you know, if you've got a writer that is open to, you know always a better story or if there's something that can improve the film or the screenplay particularly if it comes out of truth then you know then that's a really fulfilling and and great working relationship so no i'm 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 happy to work with writers and i and i think that the director has just has got to have his eyes and ears open because visually how you tell a story sometimes it's better than you know how you visually interpret something is is it can be just as powerful as words and the spoken words so you know, obviously, you know, you're dealing with a 90-minute story and or a 100-minute film, and and you need to be able to visually express that. So, yeah, I I, I li- like to collaborate, but I like to listen and work with people, and and wherever a good idea comes, wherever a good story comes from, that goes in. And your background before directing was actually in acting. Do you think uh, that brings something to how you? want to go about collaboration or what does that bring to the direction of your sets well I have I, I you know I didn't I never really it happened by accident my acting I mean I I was a director theatre director and and I got chosen to be in a in a, a few movies and and some television I think it was great experience it was when I was making my short films it was a way of funding my short films which you know 10, 12 years ago were expensive. You had to shoot them on 35 mil. Even if you were pulling favours, you would. it'd be difficult to get the kind of the budget together to shoot those. So I would do a bit of acting. And I'm glad of that experience because the most important thing for me, even before that experience, was always about actors. I love working with actors and you're trying to create this moment of truth with actors and it's about for the director to be clear, to help, to support, to, to be clear with his team, but to create an environment for actors to be able to feel comfortable that they can perform and, and take a risk and and you know and whether that's you know Scarlett or Natalie on the other bowling goal or the group of children that I had in the Rift Valley it, they, they all need the same thing because you know the most important thing is what's going on in the eyes and in the performance and that's been something that I've it's been always at the center of my work. Um, Oliver Latondo, who plays Maruge, the lead character in The First Grader, he hadn't acted in 20 years um, before this film. How did he get involved with it? Well, I, I, we, went to, we were told that we'd never find this man in <laughs> Kenya. And uh, he, he was... He was uh, he, we found him very late in the process, actually, because we went on this wild goose chase all around the world trying to find somebody. And then someone said, oh, I remember this guy. My mum and dad talk about this guy in the 70s. He was a news anchor man. And, and we managed to get word to uh, Oliver's village. And he got on the bus. Six hours later, he was with me. And that, I mean, you can see his performance. I mean, it's an extraordinary performance. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's ever done anything quite like this before in his life. And I think th- the truth in his performance and the, and the history in his face as a man... Uh, I mean, extraordinary, and, and you know the children absolutely adored him. I mean, that, those children are not acting in any of those scenes. It's all kind of truthful in what they in their reactions. I mean, they just they just loved him and loved being with him, and they embraced him as soon as he went into the school. Yeah, he does give an astounding performance yeah, in the film. Stunning. And uh, another great performance comes from uh, Numi Harris, who plays Jane. And she's recently been in Miami Vice, the Pirates of the Caribbean sequels, giant, mega, you know, multi million dollar films. What was it about this film that it drawed her to it? Or what was it like on set with her? Well, she was brilliant. I mean, she was the first choice. She was the first, wow. before I'd even been to Kenya, she was my first choice. Cause, because of, you know, not only the films that you just mentioned, but she's done. You know, you know Danny Boyle's movies, the, uh, and she's done Michael Winterbottom's films. She's got great TV in, in in the UK, and she's a chameleon. Now, I mean, she's like so subtle, got a great heart. The way she talks about her work, and you know, we went in with eight people. The rest of the people we were working with, Kenyans or Africans, and she came into that school and into that environment and lived in that community with the people that we were working with. She she went in as a, as a school teacher. She went in as teacher Jane to those children. So she was fantastic. I mean, absolutely just wholeheartedly went for it. And it's pretty daunting. You know, you've got 250 children that you have to, you know, you, you have to teach every day. And, and, and these are children that are incredibly shy, withdrawn children. And she was just, she she had that... She had that warmth, but also she had the authority. And I think that really shows. And one of the things that I was very, very keen on is that, and I saw in all over Kenya, was these young women 
who were teaching, who were inspiring teachers, very little resources, but these amazing women who were juggling family, children, all of that, and it felt like it was a very modern and relevant part of the story that we should deal with that, what was going on in Kenya at the moment. So Naomi, uh, Naomi was terrific, and uh, I think her performance is w- elevated the the the, uh, the the film because she's got such great depth to her performance. Um, one interesting thing about the film is that you flash back to Maruge's past yeah. as a Mau Mau fighter. Um, throughout the film, were the where the sequences were placed within the film, was that something that was scripted or in editing? Were you constantly trying to fine-tune like where those flashbacks would pop up? Um, I think there was... I mean, they were pretty much scripted once we started once we started filming because, you know, we, we had to work quickly. We had to work with the children, the energy. The children would, you know, you know, their kids, they get bored. They would only be able to do one or two takes. So we had this great energy <laughs> behind the piece. Those... those, those uh, and had written, I think, a, a few more flashbacks than are actually we actually went out and shot. Those were the those were the those were the, um, the those were the events that he, Kamani Marugi, actually told me himself. So he told me about those those events, and so those were placed in there because they were really, as he was telling me them, you know, they were so visceral and so powerful and they so made him the man that he was those times that what had happened to him um so you know no those pretty much were how they were yeah yeah and those scenes those flashback scenes are brutal it's you know hard to watch at points what was it like filming those on set you know trying to direct um oliver in a scene where he's being stabbed with a pencil in the ears like things like that yeah. how do you get something like that dark What's it like being on that set? <laughs> I think the the those were the toughest things that I've ever had to shoot. Mm. Just because you've got the man who's sitting like you are now with me and he's holding me and he's telling me this story and then, you know, two months later you're in the village, in a in a real village where that happened, where, you know, the British went in, took everybody out, wanted you know, sh- were shooting children and families, you know. So that was the hardest scene that I've ever had to shoot because it was so, it was so powerful as he was telling me this this story. And then when in the village that I was in, we didn't do any art direction there. That was exactly the same as it was, oh, wow. you know, then in the fifties. And there were people in the scene. You can see the faces. You can tell they were there. They were part of of that time. And so when I was shooting that scene, particularly one with his wife and his children, I could hear weeping in the huts around me because people it opened up that for the people that were there at that time so but i knew that we had it had to be part of the film because it was the part it was it was so part of the man that i was with and that's his version of that story and it was a story that had been as i said you know it'd been hidden the british Mm -hmm. destroyed the records so you know this was from his from his perspective from him his point of view um but you know when you're telling a story a real story you have to you have to try and be honest with that material. So mm-hmm. uh, I think that they are powerful moments in the film, you know, and they give they enrich and the the and, and inform about a period of history that we wouldn't have otherwise known about. Mm-hmm. And the first grader, along with the other Bowling Girl, are both based on true stories. Is there something about real life events that draws you to wanting to make films like that um, more so than something fictional? No, I mean, I did Bleak House, which was Dickens' Bleak House, and, you know, I'm drawn by a good story, wherever it comes from. And what was interesting about this was that it had this contemporary feel to it, and which, and it felt modern and relevant to Africa and modern and relevant to Kenya, and to, and to you know, my understanding of what the, what the British had done in that country. Um, I think I'm drawn by just good stories and a mm-hmm. chance to tell good stories and good characters. You know, I love, yeah. I love those characters in that film. And it was the fact that it was real, and we managed to capture some of this great Kenyan humour, which infuses the whole film. Mm-hmm. You know, I think um, I think that was a great recipe for for me to 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 make this film. And you've had a couple of different release patterns with your films. Uh, The First Grader has played all over the world at film festivals, and now this month it's going into limited release. With The Other Bowling Girl, it opened kind of day and day to multiple parts of the world. What are the pros and cons of both of those release strategies, in your opinion, after your two two films? Well, 
you know, with with the with the first grader, you know, you've got you've you, you've got this film <laughs> that's that you know everybody made really for love really they you know that we we tried to be very very careful with the communities that we were going into to to make sure that they were long term looked after but the actual filmmaker everything ended up on the screen so we were this we had we we our first showings really were in the film festivals we didn't have this machine of hollywood uh, and a publicity and so i mean my belief is that that it's great. We all love the Hollywood movies, and we all go and we all watch them. And I, mm-hmm. I, you know, me as much as anybody, I love that. But there has to be a place for smaller films with a, with equal amount, you know, amount of production value and still as beautiful and as epic, and with great performances. But there has to be a place for these the stories from different parts of the world that are that are you know that, that people gather together and watch these emotional stories that mean something. And the fact that it's true. And the fact that it's affected people in such a way, I think this film will stand by, you know, audiences and word of mouth, and that's what mm-hmm. that's why you know uh, it's so important that we're in you know here at past this film festival, mm-hmm. because uh, you know I showed it in Washington last night and Boston the night before, and just having those audiences watch it and who so embraced it, um, there has to be a place in our modern culture for these stories, you know, you know that haven't got the machine, so. Uh, <laughs> I'm just hoping that people, you know, watch it, enjoy it, laugh, cry, and then go and tell their families and friends to go and watch it. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you mentioned is although the film is very dark at times, very dramatic, there is this sense of fun throughout it. Um, What was it like being on the set with all of those kids? Do you have any anecdote that might pop in your head from one of the classroom scenes? Well, I, I have to say, you know, the kids are constantly constantly were energized and excited and surprising at every turn the more we work with them the 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 more the 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 true warmth of them came out their complete thirst for knowledge and desire to learn but i think the the thing that 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 was you know that struck me most about being in the country is the humor mm. you know the, the this great Kenyan humor. I mean, every matata that you've been on. Apparently, the, the Obama had been there as a senator in in 2003, and at exactly the same point that free education was announced. Oh wow! And I don't know whether it was an urban Kenyan <laughs> myth or whatever, but he'd apparently been on you know those little matatu buses that everybody mm-hmm. gets on goats and sheep and you know and chickens and people, and they've got a tout and. Everywhere you went, it would be Obama sat in here, you know. <laughs> and so, and so, and and on the radio, radio is a huge part. The DJ culture is a huge part of everyday life in Kenya. On the buses and in people's homes, and the DJs are constantly, you know, ribbing. You know, we hear so much negative about the tribal differences, and I know that that's complex. But on the radio, there was constant banter about everything, and so I managed to to track down one of their leading. Um, DJs and mm-hmm. called a guy called Churchill and I said to him, look, I'd love you to be involved in the film. He said, if you give me, I'll give you half an hour, build a little studio near where I do my breakfast show and I'll come and do it and you give it me on cards, what I've got to say. And I told him about the Obama thing. He goes, I, I was the one, I was the one in 2003 that he said he would be the headmaster of the world. And so I was like, we've got to have this in the film, you know. And, he, and he's brilliant because he, he's like this voice of, of the of the people which is you know like a chorus and he's so mm. funny this guy he's uh he's a he's a real character so that was that was fun that was fun working with him was brilliant and uh one thing i was really reminded of in those dj scenes was uh do the right thing how it's yeah. kind of like a greek chorus throughout the film so as you say he was brought in after you had heard him was a lot of that kind of scripted by Anne? was there some improvisation thrown in was there any kind of remnants of the dj scene in the script before you no saw him no i mean it was, it was something that driving around in these matatas for hours on end trying to find locations and hearing the guys i was with cracking up and listening to what they're saying and they speak in a kind of combination of english and swahili in a kind of street language called sheng mm-hmm. and no i mean it was just something that i i when when i saw him and met him i knew it was great and i, I was very influenced by that film mm-hmm. i saw that film when i was a student 
I love that film, Do the Right Thing. I thought it was, Samuel L. Jackson played that role. It was terrific. And there was there was an, a nod to that film in there, <laughs> you know. And just the fact that the DJs do are that present all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, no, but I I literally wrote those th those <laughs> cards down because as a DJ he worked by you hand the card and he'd have the mic up and you as I guess. He works used to his producer passing him his cards, mm -hmm. and so I just put on the card, and he'd just go for it. And sometimes he'd riff a little bit more, and then you know, and sometimes he'd say exactly what was on the card. So yeah, no, that was um, that was. I mean, that's what I mean about it. It kind of had this energy about it, and mm -hmm. because we approached it in this in this way, uh, I think that that Kenyans trusted what we were doing and knew that we were trying to be honest and authentic in how we were portraying the country and and this story, which was incredibly important to them. Mm. And uh, before this film, most of everything you've done, TV, The Other Bullying Girl, were UK productions. Now that you've filmed in Kenya, are you looking to be more international on future projects, or is it just all about the story, even if it's, you know, UK, no matter where it's based? You know, no matter where it's based, mm -hmm. I'll go. If it's a good story, I'll go. I love, I love, the, I love my job. I think I'm so lucky to have been had that chance to make that film, that the BBC trusted us to go into a Kenya where there's not a perceived infrastructure to filmmaking with a small group of people you know we we did that with Kenyans and the BBC gave me that chance to make it and it was a real leap of faith from everybody and you know actually there is there are great uh, teams of people and you know and great wealth of talent as you've seen in the movie mm -hmm. and you know so often that just gets completely overlooked as these international movies for kind of time and money they go in and they just never give people a chance and I think this film uh, you know really did kind of was enriching because of that approach and I, I, I thank the BBC for that chance really you know that they, they they really did back me to go and make that film in the way that it should have been made and uh, and 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 the result is is the film that you, you'll see and you mentioned uh, you were influenced by Do the Right Thing. One of my favorite things to hear from directors are the films that influence them. So what are some other movies that influenced you wanting to get into, direct, into directing the kind of films you direct? Well, I, I you know, I, I loved... Um I love Danny Boyle's work. I, you know, I mean, I love the way he moves between television and film, and did move between television and film in his early career. So I've always watched his his work. You know, I like the, you know the masters like Alan Clark. You know, and you know, I, one of the first films I saw when I was you know when I was 11 years old was Cares by Ken Loach. Mm. You know, so I mean, I, um, I've got eclectic taste, but you know, those 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 uh, uh, directors have really influenced me and you know and, and I love Amos Peros and I love that director very very much it's you know there's uh, there's so many good storytellers <laughs> out there and you know cinema is such a kind of great way that we can learn and learn about each other and learn uh, about different parts of the world so my, my I'm, I'm so happy that this film is playing in different parts of the world you know because uh it's certainly movies from all over have really influenced me. Do the Right Thing was one of the one of the first films I, I, I had at college, and that was a stunning piece of work. Great. Thank you for sharing all this with us. Uh, what can we expect from you in the future if you can fill us in on any upcoming projects? I've just shot a movie that I did for the BBC. It's a thriller um, it's called Stolen. It was uh, uh, about that we've got a huge problem in the UK, child trafficking. Mm. and uh, child slavery um, so I, I've just I just finished that just before I came out to do this and oh, wow. so yeah so but my 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 next few weeks and months are going to be promoting this because you know it's uh, it needs the filmmakers to be behind the film because we mm -hmm. haven't got that publicity machine so I'm very happy to to be going out and talking and spreading the word about this because I you know I know audiences have responded to it and we just need people to come to the cinema to watch it and that's me and Naomi Harris the actress she's doing the same thing so um, that's for the immediate future I'm going to be spreading the word on this film all right well is there anywhere that fans can keep up with you online a website a facebook anything yeah, like that i think there's a facebook um that they're setting up hmm. um for for this and for people to talk about and and that's through national geographic who are starting i mean it's fantastic national geographic i mean we all know them for their documentaries and for their great photography they've got a new a whole new um 
new branch, which is them distributing drama films, dramatic films, um, and we're one of the first ones that they've done. So that'll be um, that's a new, whole new thing for them. So and they're great. They're really passionate and they're very um, they're very good partners for this film. You know what they stand for and the the way that they're set up. So I'm delighted that they took us on. You know because. Uh, um, and that's how people can keep in touch with the film and what's happening with the film as well. All right, great. Well, the first grader is in theaters now. By the time you watch this in limited release, make sure to look forward to an art house theater near you. And uh, Justin Chadwick, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Don't even try to buy the sign. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.